so bonjour tout le monde, good morning everybody, uh, thanks for being here uh, for my seminar. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about integrated lot sizing, some works I've been doing with uh, quite some uh, people. Um, there, was, there are some work that I did during my PhD studies uh, at the uh, HC Montreal uh, with uh, Raph uh, here and uh, Jean-François Cordeau. And there are other work with um, Ola Jabali, Chiwazong uh, from Tool Technico di Milano and uh, HC Montreal. And the uh, final work with uh, Arsenal Dansou, Julien Legrave, and uh, Francois Lavant also on over integrated dot sizing problems. But as the um, one of the aim of this seminar is also to uh, uh, get into uh, the uh, general community. Mm -hmm. oh, am I sharing the screen? Yes, it seems so. Yes. Doesn't seem to work. I can keep the mouse. So, um, as one of the aims to become a Gerard uh, member, uh, I'm going to present myself a bit uh, very quickly, very briefly. So, um, as uh, like most of you, uh, first initially I was a kid and uh, then I grew up a bit. And when I grew up, I tried to do uh, a bit of uh, mathematics. I enjoy mathematics. So, I said, okay, let's continue and do some more uh, mathematics. But then at some point I was uh, in my garden and I was looking in the sky, seeing some planes. I thought, oh, okay, the, the, the planes, they fly. Maybe it's gonna be fun to do something related to aeronautics. So this is why I joined the uh, Super Aero Engineering School in France, the one that Ralph mentioned. But then when I joined the school, I ended up uh, doing some courses on aerodynamics. And those courses, they didn't really end well for me. So this is why I'm not going to talk to you today about the, how to build planes because they will fall down for sure. So I had a very unfortunate experience with aerodynamics, but I figured, okay, let's go back to math and do a bit more math. So I did a bit more math and especially I did some operations research uh, studies and I took quite some courses, which led me to do the PhD in uh, HC Montreal. Uh, with uh, Raph and uh, Jean-François Cordeau on uh, integrated load sizing problems. And finally, here I am in front of you today. So I'm a prof at uh, uh, ESG UCAM, the business uh, faculty of uh, UCAM in the uh, analytics operations and the information technology uh, department. My teaching is more uh, related to basics of operations management and the use of technologies for operations management. But my research is more focused on dot sizing, integrated dot sizing, hence the uh, title of the presentation. So for the presentation of today, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about dot sizing. So my first slide, obviously, is to define what is dot sizing. So as we uh, uh, start on the same uh, front. So the basic dot sizing problem determines situation. We have an on demand for one or several items over a finite time horizon. And this time horizon is divided into periods. So we want to satisfy the demand uh, of uh, one or several customers for those different items. So the decision that we have to make in this dot sizing problem is how much we're going to produce in each time period and how much we are going to keep in inventory from one period to the next one. Whenever we are producing an item, it incurs a setup. So this is also one of the decisions that we have to make, the setup decisions along with the quantities that we're going to produce. And the objective in this problem is to minimize the sum of quite some operational costs. So we have the uh, setup cost, we have production cost, and we have inventory holding cost. Here you see on the slide that the production cost is is uh, in parentheses because usually in the lot sizing literature, we consider that in the time horizon, the production cost is constant. So we don't put it in the objective function because it's just going to lead to a constant because we want to satisfy the demand anyway. So we will pay a fixed cost for, for that. So this is the basic cost sizing problem. And this is what I'm going to talk uh, a lot about uh, today. But uh, what are the different parts of this talk? So first, I'm going to uh, spend a bit more time on integrated lot sizing problems. What do I mean by integrated lot sizing problem? And where can we find some integration with lot sizing and other uh, related problems? And then I will go through uh, three different projects that I've uh, uh, done. The first one is from my PhD thesis on uh, lot sizing and distribution. The second one is a um, joint work with uh, Raf, uh, Ola Jabali, and uh, Chiwazong on the uh, uh, load sizing and carbon emissions. And the last one is uh, with uh, Arsenal Jansou, Julien Legrave, and Francois Lamotte on load sizing and maintenance. 
lots and finally I will get, uh, conclude the talk. So integrated lot sizing problem. For integrated lot sizing problems, uh, we can see the we can have a point of view of the company and of the uh, supply chain. I would say. So first, let's uh, consider that we are within a company. So within a company, we want to produce a manufacturing company. We want to produce some items, and we start from some uh, raw materials here. We uh, have some process on the raw materials. They go through machines, and finally, they are. Uh, they, they are used to produce the end items. So this is the basic idea of outside raw materials production. Then we have our end items. But maybe uh, we don't have just one machine that uh, is able to process the different raw materials. Maybe we have several machines, and then we would have a problem of the lot size. Oh, we would have a lot sizing part of, for the problem, and also an assignment of the uh, lot sizing decisions to the machines. Which machine is gonna uh, do produce the different items. So this is these are two different uh, decisions. Hence, the first possibility for integrated lot sizing. But maybe it's not that we have one raw material that goes through one machine to give a, an entire time. Maybe we have different levels. So maybe we have a, what we call a bill of materials. So we start from one raw material that goes to a first machine, and maybe this gives us a work in progress, and we did another uh, raw material to continue the production process. Or we need another component, like for computers, you have the motherboard, you have the keyboard, you have the screen, etc. So we need different components, maybe, and we go to a, another machine, we have the new component that comes on the new raw material, and we continue the process. But in that spirit, we would have maybe different suppliers here, and actually we want to decide on the number of end items that we're going to produce, but also on the number of uh, subcomponents that we're going to produce. Because maybe some end items, they share um, similar subcomponents, they share similar subassembly system. So we have the decision on production for the end items, but also the decision on production for the uh, different uh, subcomponents. So this is also another integrated load sizing problem, multi-level load sizing problem. And if we consider uh, still this idea of the company, maybe we have well, we have machines and maybe they will break down, or maybe we have to clean the machines or to have some setups. So at some point we need to decide on maintenance operations. So this is another possibility to integrate load sizing decisions with other operational decisions. So for this, it's just the point of view of the company. And we can go a bit uh, further and take the point of view of the supply chain. So if I take the point of view of the supply chain, I would consider that I have a manufacturing plant where I have the actual production that takes place. And then the production, the items are sent maybe to some warehouses. And so as they are sent to warehouses, we have some transportation decisions to make along with the production decisions. Because we cannot transport something that has not been produced beforehand. So we have integrated uh, decisions here, and maybe even those items that are sent from warehouse to different retailers. So we can consider several levels of the supply chain and try to integrate all the decisions at once to minimize the cost of the whole supply chain and not necessarily just the production plant or not just, a, just, not just necessarily our own company. So this is a possibility, but the supply chains are getting a bit more uh, wide and more complex. So maybe I don't just have one distribution center or one warehouse, maybe I have several ones. So I still produce items, but I need also to decide on the transportation quantities to go to the first warehouse, to go to the second warehouse. And obviously those uh, different warehouses, they have different retailers. So I can also decide on the transportation quantities for the different retailers where there is the actual demand that appears. So this is just the downstream part of the supply chain. Obviously, I can also take into account the upstream part of the supply chain. So I can consider that I have my suppliers and I have my lot sizing decisions at the plant, but I can also decide on how much I'm going to order from my suppliers for the different raw materials or subcomponents that I need. So this is a possibility. And here you see that I put some direct art between the different links of the uh, different uh, entities, facilities of the supply chain, but I could consider that I have some routing decisions also. So this is another kind of transportation decisions that I can also link to my lot sizing decisions at the uh, production. 
So in two uh, very simple slides, you see that we can consider quite some of the decisions on top of just the lot sizing decisions. So this is uh, what I'm really interested about uh, in my uh, research. And um, those ideas of integrated lot sizing with other decisions, they are uh, shown to be quite successful in the literature. I have just put a very, very limited uh, list of papers. Uh, maybe most of you know uh, the, those two on the uh, production routing problem, the benefits uh, with the, um, uh, at Fritole and at Kellogg's that are quite uh, famous on integration of the lot sizing part and the routing part. Uh, for the companies, over the over references here are maybe more on the theoretical side to show the uh, benefits from a theoretical point of view in terms of uh, operational gains, uh, monetary gains. So this has been studied uh, already in the literature, and we have the proof that it, it makes sense to integrate the different uh, uh, decisions. So now I'm going to uh, go into the different uh, projects. The first one is from my uh, PhD thesis done at the uh, HCC Montreal on the three-level lot sizing and replenishment problem. So for this first project, uh, I consider the supply chain point of view, the one I just uh, illustrated earlier. So what is the supply chain we consider and what is the flow of goods that we have in our supply chain? So we have the items that are produced at the production plant. The items are then sent to different warehouses that are uh, not at the same place. And finally, the items are sent to the uh, different retailers. And this is at the retailer level where we have the actual demand that appears. To go from the production plant to the uh, warehouses, we have direct shipments, direct transportation. The idea behind that is that we consider that those uh, shipments, they will be performed by very large trucks from the plant to the warehouses. But from the warehouses to the different retailers, we have actually some routes that we want to, uh, to build. Why? Because we consider that the trucks are going to be actually quite smaller. So like they go to urban areas and they can do actually some routes. So we have the production, the lot sizing decisions, the transportation decisions, and the routing decisions to make at once. But this is the, uh, the idea of the problem, to make all those decisions at once instead of having some sequential decisions where we want to produce first and then see how much we send or vice versa. So this is the general idea of the problem. And in this problem, we consider quite some constraint, quite some different constraints. We have some production capacity constraints. We have some transportation constraints, uh, the capacity of the different trucks. We have, uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that the roads, they can change from one period to another. So in this problem, and I forgot also that slide, sorry. So the other thing we want to uh, check in that project was to um, analyze the possibilities and the gains of um, split demand and split delivery possibilities. So what are those two possibilities? Um, let's consider for a specific retailer that we have a demand for one blue item, one red item, and one green item in, let's say, in period three. We consider first split demand. Split demand, what does it mean? This demand for the three items, we can send them in different time periods. So for instance, here I would send the item blue uh, in period one, the item red in period two, and the item uh, green in period three. So this is what we consider by split demand. And we also consider the possibility of having split deliveries. So split deliveries, it would mean that it's not just one track that can visit a customer in a specific time period, time period, but it can be several tracks. So here in the period three, I would have one track to deliver the blue item, one track to deliver the red item, and one track to uh, deliver the green item. So these are the two possibilities that we consider. And obviously we consider that we can have both uh, possibilities at the same time, just one of them or none of them. So we wanted to see what are the gains uh, with those splitting possibilities. So in the problem, as I was uh, mentioning, we have quite some constraints. The production capacity constraint at the plant, the transportation constraints, and we have the vehicle routes. So all of that makes the problem quite uh, challenging. So we didn't want to go to an um, exact method to solve the problem. We decided to have uh, two heuristic approaches. A first heuristic, which is a top-down approach, and the second heuristic, which is a bottom-up approach. And in the two heuristics, we have the same general idea. 
The general idea of the heuristics is to decompose the main problem into two sub-problems that are going to exchange some information, and then we perform some iterations in order to improve the solution we have uh, so far. So we have intensification and diversification tests. So I'm going to explain you the two different approaches that we have uh, designed. So the first approach we have designed is a top-down approach. So in the top-down approach, if I go back to my supply chain, the production plant is the leading facility of the supply chain. So we consider that we make the production decisions, and those decisions, they lead the rest of all the decisions related to transportation and invention. So we decompose this problem into two sub-problems. The first sub-problem we consider is actually what we call in the literature the one warehouse multi-retailer problem. So we consider the production plant and all the warehouses, and the decisions we want to make are just the flow of goods, so the blue arcs here, on top of the production decision at the uh, production plant. How we can have some production decisions if we don't have the notion of demand? Actually, initially in this uh, top-down approach, we consider that we have already assigned the different retailers to the warehouses. So as there is some kind of notion of demand for each warehouse in each time period. So with this notion of demand, then we can also have a demand for the uh, production plant and we can have those cut sizing decisions. So this is the first sub problem. And the second sub problem is obviously the rest of the supply chain. We want to decide on the flow of goods between the warehouse and the different retailers. And what we know, what is the information we have from the first part is the information on the blue arcs. So how much is available at each warehouse in each time period to be sent to the different retailers. You may have noticed here that I didn't put some routing decisions. I don't have some routes from the warehouses to the different retailers. Because in this second sub problem, we consider direct shipments in order to make the problem a bit more easier. But we will be able to build routes from the solution of this problem. So let's imagine that you have this solution. You have a warehouse and you visit the different retailers. You have this idea, this solution that says, I'm going to send some items to the different retailers. Well, you know the retailers, the position of the retailers, you know the position of the warehouse. You can solve a travel incentive problem, and then you will build the routes based on this solution. So it's very the, it's the uh, way we do to build the routes. Now, I mentioned a bit earlier that in this top-down approach, I fix the assignment of the retailers to the warehouse. So you may wonder, OK, what happens if a retailer is not uh, visited by a warehouse? If you, in the second sum problem, you don't have any items sent from a specific warehouse to a retailer. So that would be this case. I don't go to visit that retailer. How do I build the routes? Well, initially, I can still uh, solve a traveling, a traveling salesman problem. So I can still have this problem. I just know that I'm not going to visit the retailer on the left side. So I just have this part of the row. So I go from the warehouse, first retailer, second retailer, and I go back to the warehouse. With this route that I was able to uh, build, then I can have also some idea of cost for the best insertion into a specific route, and it will help in the intensification phases of the heuristic. So at a glance, the heuristic is as follows. I start, I have my first problem, one warehouse multi-retailer. I decide on the uh, production quantities at the factory and on the uh, transportation decision between the plant and the warehouses. Second problem, I want to have some routes, and this is where I have an intensification phase where I update my visiting plot in red here. As I have a fixed assignment initially of retailers to warehouses, and I have some setup decisions at the plant and at the warehouses, this is where I have some diversification iterations to whether update the retailer's assignment or to uh, add some diversification concern on the setup. So this is the idea of the first heuristic, the top-down approach. The second idea is to have a bottom-up approach. So as you can imagine, in this uh, heuristic, it's not the plant, which is the leading uh, entity of the supply chain, but these are the retailers. This is why they are bigger here on the, on the screen. So the replenishment decisions at the retail level 
are the leading decisions uh, in my supply chain. Still, uh, still the same idea, I decompose the problem into two different subproblems that will extend some information. So in this bottom-up approach, the first subproblem is to have an assignment of the retailers to the different warehouses. For each time period, I solve this assignment problem, and this gives me the uh, this kind of solution. I know that this warehouse will be responsible for those two retailers, etc. Based on that, I have a notion of demand again for the different warehouses, and I can solve again a one warehouse multi retailer problem. So this time I know the demand at each warehouse and I want to decide on the production quantities at the plant and on the uh, transportation decisions between the plant and the different warehouses. Again, I have also some uh, road building mechanism. I have my initial assignment. I have my assignment from the first problem of retailers to the warehouses. I can still use the uh, traveling salesman approach to uh, build the route. So this is what we do. We have the assignment of retailers to warehouses that help us build some routes. We update some visiting costs to have some intensification iterations. We go to the uh, second sub-problem where we decide on the production decisions and the transportation between the plant and warehouses. And we diversify the search by changing the retailer's replenishment plan. Because this is the first decision we make at the retailer level, so we uh, diversify the search by changing that. So with those two uh, heuristics, we wanted to have some idea of how they, per uh, how they perform. So we checked on uh, some instances. They may seem a bit small, uh, just six time periods, uh, 10 or 20 retailers, a few warehouses, few items and trucks. And uh, so we tried also on the different version with the splitting possibilities, split demand and split delivery. We use CPEX as a solver, and we give one hour uh, time. So I'm going to show you some results that we obtained uh, on the top-down approach and on the bottom-up approach. So first, we wanted to look at the um, objective function. What we saw is with our instances was that the top-down approach was able to uh, give the best solutions in terms of cost, except when we have just demand splitting, where the bottom-up approach gives the best uh, solution in terms of cost. We were also curious on the um, distinction between having just delivery splitting or just demand splitting. And it seems that having just delivery splitting was is more beneficial in terms of cost for the company. So then we wanted to look also at the performance in terms of the um, CPU time. So in terms of the CPU time, the results are the two approaches, they, uh, they run quite fast. The top-down approach a bit, uh, takes a bit longer. But it's not uh, it's not that much, and we actually also uh, designed a branch and cut approach to compare to an exact method, and the branch and cut uh, performs much uh, worse than those uh, values here. What was also interesting to look at was the um, proportion of time where the instance where we had actually some um, delivery splitting and demand splitting, and what we saw is that the delivery splitting part really happens a lot in the solutions uh, we obtain. So delivery splitting, I um, really use different trucks to uh, to go and deliver the different items. So this happens really a lot compared to demand splitting, which happens uh, very in a very few instances. What was also interesting to see is that delivery splitting happens much more when we have the bottom-up heuristic. And it's quite intuitive because this uh, bottom-up heuristic starts from the retailer level. So where we have actually the flexibility of having the, uh, those splitting possibilities. So this was quite uh, expected. The final thing we wanted to look at is that those two approaches, they are like um, sequential approaches compared to an integrated approach. And I mentioned in the two uh, heuristics, we have some diversification iterations. So we said, let's compare a scenario where we have no diversification mechanism compared to this uh, scenario where we have those diversification iterations. And if we compare, this is the uh, what we have here in the last column. So the gains uh, with the diversification mechanism. So we have few gains. Well, so for a company, it would be quite a, a satisfactory still to have the, those gains. So this is. Uh, this is the last thing we wanted to go. 
So for this first project, this is all I wanted to mention. And now I'm going to turn to a second project. So the second project uh, has been done with uh, Raf Shant and Tirazon from uh, HEC Montreal and uh, Ola Jabali at uh, Polytechnico de Milano. And here the idea is to work on the one warehouse multi retailer problem with carbon emissions. So the one warehouse multi retailer problems, you have already seen the picture in the previous slides. This is the picture of the one warehouse multi retailer problem. So you have I just uh, get the factory and the different warehouses, but the idea, you have a warehouse, you have retailers, and you send some uh, goods from the warehouse to the retailers using direct shipments. There is no uh, routing decisions here whatsoever. So in this problem, uh, this is, the decisions you have to make are the setup decisions at the warehouse level, the setup decisions at the uh, retailer level, and the quantities that are going to be ordered by the warehouse and by the different retailers. So we have both setup and quantities to uh, decide. We also decide on some inventory that we can keep from one period to the next one, both at the warehouse and at the retailer level. So the warehouse also can keep some inventory. The objective, to minimize the sum of all the setup cost and inventory holding cost. Uh, here again, we don't have some production or replenishment cost. Uh, basic lot sizing assumption that it will be constant in our time horizon and we uh, would have just a constant in the objective function. So the idea of this project is to integrate so those lot sizing decisions with some carbon uh, considerations. Given the high temperature, I don't think I need to emphasize on the uh, motivation to consider carbon emissions uh, uh, to like, its important climate change, etc. So where do we have uh, those carbon emissions? We consider that we may have some carbon emissions at the warehouse level. Whenever we have some replenishment or production at the warehouse level, then we need to set up some equipment. We need to uh, get some things to put in the different warehouses, in the rackings. Then it may end up um, leading to some emissions. Obviously, when we have transportation from the, the warehouse to the retailers, we have also some uh, emissions related to transport. The last place where we will have uh, emissions are related to inventory. So here you would have the supply chain in the specific time period and in the next time period. You have some inventory that can go from one period to the next one on the red arcs here. But though this inventory that you can keep, it may lead to some emissions. So this is the last part where we have the emissions. Why would you would have some emissions? Because maybe you need to cool the warehouse, you need to cool the retailer, you need to heat the warehouse or the retailer's uh, uh, shop. So you have some emissions related to that. So this is where we have those emissions. In the problem, so we consider that oh. we have uh, no lead time, no backlog, um, some initial inventory available um, at the uh, retailer level, and the global uh, carbon emission constraint. So what do I mean by a global carbon emission constraint? It means that we look at all the emissions from the setup decisions and the um, inventory uh, decisions, and we consider that we cannot go uh, beyond a certain threshold on the whole time horizon. We could have considered on a specific time period, uh, on the rolling horizon uh, kind of way, but we decided that okay, let's consider the whole time horizon. So in this uh, project, um, we still wanted to use a heuristic to solve the, the problem. But first, before um, tackling the one warehouse multi retailer problem with carbon emissions, we figured let's try a heuristic to solve just the one warehouse multi retailer problem that we will be able to use with the uh, emission considerations. So, the general idea in this uh, heuristic we designed to, for the one warehouse multi retailer problem is to divide the problem into two stages. First, we decide on the setup decisions at the warehouse level. And second, we decide on the setup decisions at the retailer's level. With the setup decisions, obviously, we can also have access to the um, ordering replenishment decisions. So how do we do for the uh, first stage? So the first stage, we want to have those setup decisions at the warehouse level. So here, the idea is to go from our one warehouse multi retailer problem to a two-level lot sizing problem. So we kind of aggregate all the retailers into one very big retailer. 
And this very big retailer will have the, a demand, which is the sum of all the demands from the different retailers, same for the setup cost. So we have one big retailer. So this is a triple vendor sizing problem, and we solve this problem to have access to the uh, production decision at the warehouse. And then at the uh, second stage, we want to decide, we want to obtain the um, retailer setup decisions. So for this second stage, we use two different approaches. The first approach we used was a time partitioning relaxed outfits approach. And the second one was a dynamic programming approach. So I'm gonna um, illustrate those two methods. For the time partitioning relax and fix approach, the idea is as follows. We do some different iterations and we consider just a subset of the time periods. And we optimize the setup decisions on the subset of the time periods. So I have here this first part where I optimize my setup decisions. The rest is not considered. Then I move a bit in the second iteration and I have some part of the decision uh, which are fixed and another part which are optimized. Still the rest of the, of the decisions of the variables are not considered. And I do some iterations until I reach the end of the time horizon. So with this approach, it gives me a retailer's replenishment plan, retailer's setup plan. The second approach we used was to have a dynamic programming approach. So in the dynamic programming approach, the idea is to go from this one warehouse multi retailer setting to a bunch of two level lot sizing problem. Because here I can consider just this pair, warehouse retailer. And the question I would ask myself on this specific two level lot sizing problem would be, okay, what is the best retailer replenishment plan for this retailer specific thing? So I asked the question, and from the literature, we have a dynamic programming approach to solve this kind of problem. So it leads me to the decisions, the setup decisions at the retailer for this specific retailer. And then I go to the next retailer, and I ask the same question. What is the best ordering setup plan, the best setup plan? I use my dynamic programming approach from the literature, and I have this decision. And I go through all the different retailers, and then I will have the set of decisions for all the retailers. So these are the two different approaches. So this is the um, for the UST to solve just the one warehouse multi-retailer problem. But our idea was to solve the one warehouse multi-retailer problem with a carbon emission concept. So here it's a model of the problem. Um, I didn't put a slide with the uh, different parameters, decision variables, but very quickly we have we minimize the sum of setup costs. So the Y variables are the setup decisions. And we have some inventory related decisions, the sigma variables, which represent how much we keep in inventory in each period K in order to satisfy a later demand in period. We have similar production uh, variables, the W variables, how much I produce at the plant or I order at the warehouse level in period K to satisfy the demand in period T. And the W1 variable would be how much I order um, in period K to satisfy the demand in period Warehouse level, retailer level. This is called in the literature the multi commodity formulation, and it has proven to be quite um, successful in terms of performance, uh, both theoretically and uh, practically. So, this is why we use this approach. Our main constraint it is this constraint. I was mentioning a global carbon emission constant. This is my global carbon emission constant. So I sum all of the emissions from all the different decisions, and it cannot go up to a certain threshold. So the idea of a heuristic to solve this problem is to say, well, this constraint is a hard one. It's, comp it's a complicating one, the carbon emission constant. Well, let's just put it in the objective function, and we will penalize it. So we penalize it, we penalize the emissions with a certain uh, factor that we call beta. I said that we penalize the emissions in the objective function, but actually what I wrote in the model, it's more that we balance the emissions with the different costs. Because you see that this beta parameter also appears in front of the different uh, costs that I have. Setup costs, inventory holding costs. So 
our ID of the heuristic is to play with this parameter beta. What does it do, this parameter? If I put beta equals to one, then I will just focus on the emission part. So I solve my, if I solve my problem, I will minimize the emissions. So I will end up with a feasible solution. So this is what I want to have, a feasible solution. On the other side, if I have a beta equals to zero, then it means that I'm just focusing on the costs and I don't look at all at the emission considerations. So maybe I will obtain an infeasible solution if I have a beta equal to zero. And in between, I don't have any guarantee that, we'll, that I will obtain a feasible solution because I put some emphasis on the cost, the rest on the emissions, but I'm not sure that I'm gonna have a feasible solutions in a feasible solution, sorry, in terms of the emission, the global emission constraint. But if I go back to my model, so we play yeah, with the value of beta. But if I go back to my model, here what we have actually, it represents a one warehouse multi retailer problem. And we have just designed a heuristic algorithm to solve this one warehouse multi retailer problem. So our generic ID is to solve the one warehouse multi retailer problem using the previous heuristic, and we play with the value of beta. We do some iterations with, on the value of beta to obtain a feasible solutions and lower the costs. So at a glance, the, yeah, we will uh, we bear with the value of it. We have some two issues. The first issue, and it's all linked with the um, heuristic we used to solve the one where integrator problem. The first issue we have is that we have a fixed ordering setup plan at the warehouse level in our uh, heuristic. So with that issue in mind, we said, okay, Let's try to tackle this issue and we diversify the search. So we make some iteration, diversification iterations on the warehouse setup plan. So not just some iterations on the value of our beta parameter. The second issue we have is that as we have initially in our heuristic, an aggregation of all the retailers into one big retailer, then it may lead to some infeasibility in the solution we obtain, because the aggregation, disaggregation implies maybe some more um, setup decisions or some more uh, setup emissions at the retailer level. So what we do in order to tackle this issue is that we have developed an iterative local search mechanism to try and improve also the solution we have in case we have some infeasibility issues. So with those two issues in mind, the heuristic we have to solve the problem is as follows. So we penalize the uh, emission constraint. We solve a one way of material problem. If our solution is feasible regarding the emission constraint, then we can reduce the value of the beta parameter to put more emphasis on the cost compared to the emissions. But if it's infeasible, then we have a uh, you know, iterated local search mechanism. And if it's still infeasible, then we go to a diversification mechanism where we change the warehouse setup plan. We do those iterations in order to have finally a feasible solution. And we record the solution with the best cost. So in terms of uh, instances and results, so we tested our heuristic on instances from the literature, 50, 100, 150 retailers, 15 or 30 time periods, and some inventory uh, available potentially at the retailer level. So the first set of uh, experiments that we did was on the heuristic for the basic one warehouse multi retailer problem without any emission considerations. So what we obtain as results, so the columns here with the dynamic programming approach and the columns here with the time partition with like the approach, um, we were quite um, satisfied by the results obtained because the gap was like 0.5% away from the optimal solution obtained using CPLEX, but the CPU time taken was just roughly between two and 4% of the CPU time taken by CPLEX. So we take 2%, let's say on average 3% of the time taken by CPLEX, and we have solutions 0.5% away from the optimal mode. So we thought it was a very good um, start for our uh, bigger heuristic where we considered the emission considerations. So for the emission considerations, 
I reported the CPU time taken by CPLEX and some uh, metrics on the different approaches. The first thing we wanted to look at is, is our heuristic able to find some feasible solution? And the answer is yes in 90% of the instances. Um, I didn't describe all the instances, but what we did with the um, emission constraint is that we play a bit with this emission because we can solve the problem without the emission and take a look at what are the um, uh, the lowest possible emissions to have a feasible solution, and we take a look at the lowest uh, the cost with the the solution with the lowest cost and see the emissions. So we can have some kind of um, ID of the interval in between the emissions would like. So we try and see that, and we obtain 90% uh, of feasible solutions. Satisfactory, I would say. If we take a look at the gap, 2% uh, away from the optimal solutions in terms of costs. So this gap is much higher, I would say, compared to the previous set of results, just on the one warehouse multi retailer problem. This idea of the emission considerations really increases the gap compared to the optimal solution. In terms of the CPU time, however, we have quite some satisfactory results because we take roughly four seconds on average to solve the instances compared to 150 for a CPLEX. So we were also quite happy with those uh, uh, results. Something we wanted to look at also in this project was the cost of the emissions. Because often in papers, when you look at the emission considerations, you have this question of how much is going to cost me to reduce the emissions. So we asked ourselves the same question. And we looked a bit at, OK, if I uh, reduce my emissions, how much is going to cost me more? So we plotted some those curves, and then we saw, like on the blue one, you see that the blue curve is not convex. And we wanted to understand why this blue curve is not convex, because we didn't have any uh, specific idea initially on the uh, shape of the curve, but it's not convex. So we said, let's do, take a look at the solution we obtained. So the solution we obtained with these blue curves is actually that at some point, I have one more setup at the warehouse level. I go from a certain number of setup uh, operations to a higher number of setup operations. And then when I go to this higher number of setup operations, this is where I have the um, piecewise convexity that uh, appears. So we were uh, happy, well, happy. I don't know if it's the right word, but we were uh, yeah, happy to see that we have an explanation to uh, for that uh, increase and for that piecewise convexity. Last project I'm going to uh, talk to you about is a more recent one on integrated load sizing and maintenance problem. And this project has been done with uh, Arsenal Jansou here uh, and uh, Julien Legrave and uh, François Lamont. So in this project, the um, ID, the initial uh, statement is that you have machines to produce some items, you must perform some maintenance operation at some point. It's impossible to use your machines all the time, all the time. You must perform some um, maintenance operations. A classical view, I would say, would be to say, okay, if I perform some maintenance operations, then it will affect my capacity. I will have a lower capacity in the machines because they are being uh, maintained. Our uh, suggestion is to say, well, again, let's integrate the sizing decisions with maintenance decisions to know when would be the best time to perform some maintenance operations to uh, and to have a certain capacity available. So this is the initial idea of the project. In the literature uh, on um, these ideas of integrated load sizing and maintenance problem, maintenance is considered with different uh, in different ways. Um, weather and the capacity also is considered in different ways. In some papers, you see a decrease, a fixed decrease of capacity from one period to the next one with the fixed rate um, alpha. In other papers, you have a decrease of capacity based on the number of items you have produced. So the more items you produce, the uh, less capacity you have because you have some deterioration of your machine. The last uh, main body of the main hypothesis is to have some kind of threshold on the age of the machine. 
So after a specific number of time periods, you have some kind of age of your machine and you must perform some maintenance operations to go up to a certain initial age. What we used in this project is the first option, so to have a fixed uh, decrease of capacity. So every period we lose alpha percent of the capacity. If we perform a maintenance iterations, we go back to 100% of capacity. So the model we have for this problem is really simple. We have the load sizing part here in red, and we have a maintenance part. So here, briefly, what we have, we want to minimize the sum of setup costs and inventory holding costs, and we have also some maintenance costs. The load sizing part means that we want to calculate the demand, and we have some setup constraints. We have different products, and the production cannot go above a certain capacity, the capacity that we have available. And this capacity is uh, linked to the maintenance decisions. So here in the model, you see a, a, a max between two terms. Obviously, we can linearize uh, this uh, to have a, a linear problem. So if we perform a maintenance operation, then the capacity goes back to a certain uh, maximum capacity level. Otherwise, just this alpha parameter times the capacity we have previously. In this project, the idea is really to look at the modeling part, how we can model efficiently the problem. Because uh, there have been some um, modeling works on the lot sizing part and few on the maintenance part. So we wanted to look at okay, what happens on this modeling side. For the lot sizing part, in terms of model, there are three main models. The first one is a classical model, which was presented in the model. So you produce something, you can keep inventory, and you have some demand that goes out of your network. This is the classical way of modeling load sizing problem. Second way of modeling load sizing problem is called the transportation formulation. So here, the idea of the decision variable is to say how, uh, when I'm going to produce for which demand. So you have much more arcs in your network. And for instance, here, you would have how much I produce in period one to satisfy the demand of period one, how much I produce in period one to satisfy the demand of period one, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the transportation way of modeling load size. And you have a third way of modeling load size in decisions, which is a network way, very net. So here, you model how much you're going to produce to satisfy the whole demand between two uh, periods. So for instance here, how much I produce to satisfy the demand between period one and three. How much I produce in period one to satisfy the demand between period one and three. So this is called the network reformulation in the lot sizing literature. So for this uh, lot sizing part, we have three uh, already known models. But for the maintenance part, we figured this is where maybe we can bring some contributions. So we figured, well, we can some kind of um, apply also the transportation formulation to the maintenance uh, part. Imagine you are in period four here. And you know that the last period in which you perform the maintenance operation is the first period, period one. So you know that in period one, you had your maximum capacity. Let's say here that it's 100. And let's say that our decrease is um, 0 0.8. So every period, I lose 20% of my capacity. So I'm in period four. I know that the uh, last time I did some maintenance operations was in period one. So I know that in period two, my capacity was 80, 80 units. And in period three, it was 64. In period four, 51. But with this idea of knowing when was the last maintenance operation, so we have access to the capacity value for each of the time periods. So we derive uh, this um, information into decision variables, which indicate in a specific time period, when was the last maintenance operation. And then we uh, are able to obtain this uh, capacity much easier without the uh, maximum part. So this is what we wanted to look at. And we performed some experiments. We varied the number of items and periods. And in terms of the cost from the literature, uh, we wanted to have costs that roughly we have 20% of the maintenance cost in the uh, solution. So this is how we designed the different costs. 
So I'm going to show you some results. So uh, the maintenance part, how we model the maintenance, we are using a transportation ID or a classical way. And the same for load sizing, if we use a classical way, transportation or a network deformation. We use Gurobi solver and we give uh, half an hour to solve the different problems. So the first thing we wanted to look at was in terms of uh, CPU time. And in terms of CPU time, um, it seemed that the transportation uh, reformulation for the maintenance part uh, leads to lower CPU time. But it's not really um, very clear, the, the gains that we can have in terms of CPU time here. If we look also at the CPU time, just in terms of I fix my transportation formulation for the maintenance part and how it evolves with the uh, lot sizing part, surprisingly, we saw that the classical way of modeling the load sizing part led to the lowest CPU times. I say surprisingly because we know from the literature, specifically in uncapacity load sizing problem, that those reformulations, the transportation and the network, they're performing really well. They give the um, integral solution uh, and the linear relaxation. So we were quite surprised by this. And the same thing happens if we use the classical way of modeling uh, the maintenance part. Still, it's the classical load sizing formulation that gives the lowest CPU that. We also wanted to check the gaps compared to uh, the, the gap of n at the end of the uh, time limit. And we have here um, clearer pictures. The transportation uh, reformulation for the maintenance part leads to the lowest uh, gaps at the end of the um, time limit compared to the classical way. And again, if we just take a look at the um, time, uh, at the transportation reformulation for the maintenance part, it's again the classical way of modeling the sizing problem that will lead to the lowest gap. Same thing if we fix the uh, modeling, uh, the maintenance at the classical modeling way. So we were uh, surprised and this is, where we are currently with the, this project. It, it's an ongoing project, so any uh, comments is really well. So to sum up, uh, oh, no, sorry, I uh, had also this. Uh, we wanted also to have a look at what happens if we vary this alpha parameter, so the decrease uh, of capacity. And it's not clear uh, so far uh, what happens. Obviously, if you increase the size of the instance, the, the gap gets higher, the CPU time gets higher. But you can see, for instance, here you go from 400 seconds to 140, you go up again. So it's not clear how the CPU time and the gap they really evolves with this parameter. So we will need to uh, dig a bit uh, more into that. So as a conclusion, uh, what I showed you in this uh, seminar, uh, integration of load sizing and transportation decision in a supply chain context. Integration of flood sizing and carbon emissions, still in the supply chain content. And integration of flood sizing and maintenance decision, but uh, within a company. So what is left to do, and this is where uh, Rav's joke, initial joke uh, comes into uh, play. So in the title, I mentioned thousands possibilities. I showed you three. So we have uh, 997 remaining possibilities to, uh, to tackle. And before uh, giving you the floor, I just want to uh, mention that we're organizing uh, with the two colleagues, Marilyn Charcassi and Frédéric Kennel, a writing activity. It's a year long activities uh, for uh, PhD students, master students, postdoc uh, students. So you can go on the uh, Gerard uh, website and you will see uh, all the, uh, what you can do. The idea of your, the activity, we mimic a publication process you uh, play the part of the reviewers and you can get uh, also some um, tools and workshops on how to answer to reviewers, how to uh, write well uh, scientific papers. So if you're a student, you can just go and register. If you're a prof, you can send that to your students. Thank you lots for your attention.